Thank you, Per. So it's actually really good that I'm just after a risk-based authentication talk that is showing you what uh, very big companies are doing. Today, I'm just going to talk about how we at Kindred, uh, we are protecting our customers against password risk attacks or password stuffing attacks uh, in 2019. So small disclaimer, I have a tendency to walk around a lot. So if at some point I disappear behind the scene, it's, it's, it's a possibility. It's, it's, it may happen. So who am I? Uh, I'm Pierre Antoine Arbachminska. Uh, just my first name and last name already makes a nice password or passphrase. I'm the security operations lead at uh, Kindred. So I manage the blue team uh, at Kindred. So we are part of group security. I'm also a member of uh, Team Ashkat uh, for competitions. And I'm also a member of uh, the French community in security. Uh, disclaimer, if you haven't uh, heard it from my accent yet, I'm French. So I may use some French limbo here, lingo, starting. <laughs> I'm uh, Edouard on Twitter, and uh, you have my email here if you want to contact me. I will put it in the end as well. A few words about Kindred. So we are a gambling, online gambling company. Uh, so we have a lot of licenses in Europe, but not only, also in Australia and uh, coming in the US. We have also offices a bit everywhere, so we have a very large attack surface. And since we are in the gambling sector, it's also a quite exposed uh, sector. We have 1,500 employees, um, 25 million customers, so not so big, but still quite big. If you don't know Kindred Group, you may know one of our brands, probably Unibet, which is the biggest one. Uh, if you are in some other countries, you may know also uh, to Red or Bingo.com. And why this talk? Uh, the motivation be behind this talk is just that there are a lot of great talks, especially here at PasswordsCon, about state-of-the-art research, about what very big companies are doing or implementing, uh, about web authentication, for instance, human behavior reading passwords, uh, attack uh, and password squacking. A lot of things that is really good, really interesting. But from a defender point of view, I'm really missing uh, talks like the one I'm going to give. And I want to, to fill that gap, to have a public presentation about this, to give a defender point of view on password reuse attacks and how we try to protect from it. And there are a lot of reasons for people not to give this kind of talks, because you don't want to give clues to attackers, uh, because you don't want to be too much transparent about what you're doing, or uh, even I say lack of time, because when you're a defender, usually you have incidents, incidents, incidents. So you're a bit like, uh, I don't want to, to commit for a talk. But yeah, I'm trying to fill that gap. And today we're going to talk about three things. First of all, deep dive around password risk attacks. I guess there, is, there will be a larger talk on that subject tomorrow. Uh, just on our, what we see, uh, what, um, what's our strategy to defend against them. Uh, and more in detail than reactive measures that we have implemented and also proactive measures. Also disclaimers, as I mentioned, we are not Google nor Facebook. We are not, we don't have unlimited manpower to build new tools, to have uh, data science or artificial intelligence everywhere. We don't do that. Uh, our sweat model that I'm going to show in the next slides is probably not your sweat model. So you have to assess your own sweat model and what are your risks. Also, the limits of this talk is that I'm only going to talk about the outer layer, so perimeter protection. So just protection of the authentication endpoints. I'm not going to talk about other things that may happen further down the line. Also, uh, not everything, not all the measures that we'll talk about here are implemented in all our brands, our markets. Uh, this can depend, yeah. And the main goal for us, uh, as we'll see just after that, is we want to raise the cost for the attacker. We want uh, to make the attack too costly for him to be able to uh, attack us and to still make a profit. And in our specific area, one big issue is money laundering. So usually money launderers, they can lose 20, 30 percent of what their initial stake can go much higher. So they also have money, so the cost uh, for us to try to match when we are trying to raise our cost is quite high. So deep dive on password release attacks. Uh, this slide, I think it's a key time talk for password scan. So uh, there is a massive surge in password stuffing attacks or password use attacks in the last few years. Uh, you have billions of credentials in the wild 
so exploiting, exploit in Combolis, it was 500 million, but uh, earlier this year there was collections one to five, which was one terabyte in size. So just imagine the amount of credentials you have in that. Uh, you can check have I been pwned if you want more example of uh, websites breached. breached. And the issue with that if, is if you don't have MFA or uh, website means risk-based authentication profile, then having those credentials and reusing them on your website means immediate compromission. And for us, that means a few things. That means uh, if an attacker gets access to an account, he can still found on them because when you are on a gambling website, usually you put money on your account and then you play with that money. You don't do both. Uh, you don't pay to get money and play directly. Usually you have a balance and you keep it there. So that's a risk. Second risk is money laundering, uh, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, they are ready to spend a lot of money to be able to uh, uh, get their money in and get their money out and trying to uh, layer uh, the transfer. And also all your, the various uh, fraud schemes that I'm not going to, to talk about much uh, in depth here. Very high level uh, ecosystem of password reuse attacks. Uh, usually it starts with a data leak. Uh, if the passwords are in plain text, they can be resold directly. If not, someone will crack them and then just resell the uh, list with uh, emails and uh, passwords. Then you have someone uh, it's more worlds here, but I would just say you have someone uh, that will say, oh, uh, I want to have uh, uh, valid accounts on Unibet.com, for instance. So I will try to use this list that I uh, bought here that is about this data leak, and I will try to, uh, using a botnet that I will, I will run, I will try a lot of logins on this uh, website to uh, really see which accounts are valid. So it can be different roles, can be one guy, can be several guy, one for each, could be multiple things, multiple layers of resellers. But in the end, what happens is uh, those cracked accounts they are sold usually to other final clients because they don't need to have, let's say, 1,000, 2,000 cracked accounts. They just need a few of them to be able to do what they want. And then they are used on, against, uh, on the websites for the various fraud uh, schemes I mentioned earlier. One interesting thing, thing to see here is that the time between uh, the, the account is tested on the website and the time uh, on which the account is used is not the same. There is a delay, especially if there are more layers and more people that are uh, selling the accounts. So for us as Defender, it's also a window of opportunity to be able to detect that and try to prevent it, prevent the fraud usage at the end if we manage to detect it uh, a bit later, and, but not prevent it. And we've seen a lot of different attacks. Uh, we've seen very targeted attacks where just individuals or uh, small groups were targeted. Uh, probably manual checking, we didn't see automated behavior on that. Uh, really using a browser, uh, IP addresses from the countries where the users were located. So risk-based authentication in, in that situation, it doesn't really work. They've done their um, uh, recon beforehand. And this can have a very impact for affected customers because then since it's tested manually, usually they go with the fraud scheme directly when they test it. So the delay between uh, testing and uh, usage is really small. On the other hand, we also see massive enumerations. And ma when I say massive, it's hundreds of thousands of requests or even millions or dozens of millions, um, tens of thousands of source IP addresses or sometimes even more. Uh, IP geos distributions that can be global or more regional, really like a botnet. And then the impact on customer is much more variable. It's not like a targeted attack where it's used directly. There, there is really a time window where we can also try to, to block it. And this time window, it can be a few hours, can be a few days, can be even more sometimes. Uh, but that's much more noisy. So we can see this kind of stuff and we can uh, uh, prevent it, as we'll see later. And one other thing is we see everything in between. We've seen attacks where they were using a large uh, botnet, tens of thousands of IP addresses, and with each IP they were just doing one request, for instance. This kind of thing. We've seen attacks where people uh, had, were doing uh, requests every 30, 35 minutes, uh, plus or minus uh, five minutes. So. You just see in the 
background noise, a few requests, and when you look at it, oh, it looks like it's periodic. Maybe there is something. So you really see everything. Our overall strategy, since we don't really have unlimited manpower, we ne really need to focus on something. And our overall strategy is to really focus on our side, at least, uh, on the massive attacks, to be able to detect, react, and prevent them uh, in a much more automated way. That way we can free up time from analysts that then will be able to focus on more uh, comp uh, complex cases, targeted cases. And we want to re reduce the delay between uh, the credential check, so the initial testing of the user, and uh, the compromission, uh, and the containment to avoid the compromission. And the goal behind that is really to push the attacker to be much more reactive, to not just launch an attack and forget, to really re raise the cost for them. Another area uh, in our strategy is that we want to really focus on basic blocks and quick wins, because uh, both are really important. A quick win because you can quickly block something, but also the basic block because if you just implement a quick win but uh, it cannot be expanded for the more afterwards, it's useless. So let's spend much more time uh, doing a basic blocks that we can reuse in other automation, uh, using other APIs, and let's just get better at it. So it can be a containment, can be uh, rate limiting, as we'll see later. But it's really about building foundations that we can then grow on. At Kindred, uh, security and fraud is handled by different departments. Uh, we have smaller fraud departments, teams, uh, that usually uh, focus on individual cases that are doing this investigation on the accounts to really find patterns, to really find complex cases, and to be able to know exactly what's going on. Uh, you have my team, who is more responsible for incident response at a larger scale and investigation of cases, in much larger scale as well, and monitoring of the perimeter. And then you have other sec um, security teams that are more technical. You also have architecture development teams that are all working together to try to build uh, mechanisms and uh, technologies around uh, preventing this kind of attacks. Last but not least, customer service. We often forget them, but they are frontline with customers. They are here to help us communicate with them, and they are here also to help customers <laughs> communicate with us if we miss something or if, on the other hand, we want to take some actions on accounts. Customer service is there for that. And fighting fraud, fighting uh, password reuse attacks is really a very tight cooperation between everyone. And you need communication, and you need uh, cooperation between teams. Otherwise, it doesn't work. You cannot just implement stuff, uh, implement technologies without having human cooperation to fight that. For the reactive measures uh, we have, the f one of the first we've implemented uh, is what we call account containment, so first password reset. The rationale behind that is on an operational level, we need to act quickly if we suspect an account to be at risk. We cannot just ask customer service to uh, go for each account, to contact the customer, to ask them to change their password and to first reset their password. We need to automate that. The idea, again, is to limit the time window during which the attacker might use the account. It's also to nullify the validity of the credentials he may have gotten. Because if the uh, validity of the credentials is nullified, then he cannot use them, so it's useless. And if you're in the situation of an attacker testing accounts on the platform and then reselling them, and then it's a finite client for him that will use those uh, credentials. So if it doesn't work, if they don't work, and it happens all the time because we are faster than him all the time, his reputation will drop. So that's a side effect as well. And from the customer point of view, we want to limit uh, the potential, uh, potential impact on their account, and we also want to inform them uh, about the potential risk. We don't want to leave them in the dark. So to do that, we implemented things on two different levels. First one is that uh, we have now have a technical process to automate um, the reset of the account passwords, and also to trigger a specific uh, communication to the customer. On the fraud side, uh, now the teams have a dedicated back office to easily trigger this process, to not have to go to other teams to be able to do that. Now they can trigger that directly. So if we were to uh, have dozens of customers that are being uh, at risk, or even more, 
then we can just bulk passwords they reset them and also trigger a specific communication to them specific for the brand and everything. And it looks like this. Well, it's in Russian, so I will put it in English. So it looks like this. Um, it's, I've done that on my test account. That's why it says dear test. We don't actually have a customer saying uh, called test. And I guess you cannot read it if you're at the back, but the global idea is uh, this is not solicited by the customer, so we don't put any links. Uh, as mentioned this morning, you don't want to put links in a security mail asking to change a password that is not solicited by the client. Definitely not. Don't uh, get them used to click on phishing emails. What we say is that there is a potential risk on the account. We specifically ask to choose a new password and to pick a password that has not been used elsewhere. So that's the three main points here. We really want the client to know that there is an issue, on, uh, a potential issue on uh, his account. There is a security risk, and he has to choose a password that is not used elsewhere. One other point is something we call internally online front service. It's rate limiting, basic rate limiting. It's not uh, advanced uh, risk-based uh, um, assessment. So again, we want to force the attacker to distribute the attacks and to limit his uh, request rate. So really, so first one, distribute the attacks because now if he wants to do the same amount of queries, he will have to run a much larger botnet, so it will cost more for him. And limit his request rate, it's the other way around. So if he wants to do the same amount of requests, he has to do requests on a much larger time span. So he has to run the botnet for much longer as well. So what we do is some kind of rate limiting of authentication requests. We use multiple factors uh, to do that. Uh, I guess you, uh, the guy who did the talk just before, yeah, you can probably uh, guess uh, what we used, what we are using for, for that. I think I will see you in the logs in a few days. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we are using multiple factors and information uh, to uh, do this rate limiting. It's not just IP addresses. Um, we try to get as much information as possible, but at the same time, uh, it's hard for us to do that because customers can authenticate through browsers, native applications that are using APIs, or even native clients on Windows that are also using APIs. So we don't have much information. So we try to be inventive on that side. And depending on the risk, and, uh, we can either allow um, the authentication flow to continue, and as if uh, there is uh, no issue. We can also reject the authentication, and in this case, we don't give any specific uh, error code. It's like authentication failed, as if the login is bad or the password is bad. So we don't give any clue to the attacker that there is actually right limiting. Uh, this may have some uh, user experience implications, but at the same time, when this triggers, it's usually that it's automated or there is a higher risk. And third, uh, last but not least, we prompt for CAPTCHA if we have a doubt on the connection. People will say, oh, but uh, yeah, CAPTCHA, it's uh, easy to break. Sure, but it's one more thing to implement for the attacker. So it's still raising the cost. You don't need to be state of the art, you just want to raise the cost. And for me, it does the trick. <coughs> one other point uh, that is really important, maybe is the most important here, is monitoring and alerting. All the measures you can implement, technically or humanly, uh, they will have gaps. You always have gaps. And the only way to try to fill those gaps is to have a lot of monitoring, alerting, and to be able to review what has happened to see uh, what were the patterns, to try to improve all the time. So we want to limit the risk of missed attacks, and we also want to gather intelligence on new patterns to be able to improve everything I'm presenting here. So what do we do for that? We have detailed logging of the parameter, especially logging endpoints, uh, to really know what's happening and how. And we have a large set of alerts for two things. First thing is to know uh, like bad pattern, known bad patterns, we want to trigger an alert directly to be able to act on this as soon as possible. And second one is for things that are more suspicious. Um, let's say there is a, uh, a spike in a uh, authentication failures on a very specific endpoint in a very spe specific way. It could be uh, legitimate. We are a gambling operator, so we are doing sports uh, gambling. 
So if there is a big Champions League game, we will have a spike. If there is a big, uh, like uh, the first game at a uh, Euro or um, World Championship, you will have a spike, and it's probably customers that haven't logged in in a long time, so we'll have a spike in uh, uh, bad logins as well. So it may not say be that it's bad, but it's just suspicious, so we need to take a look at it. So we want to really try to, again, improve all the time based on what we detect. And now we go for proactive measures, and the first one is uh, a bit funny, uh, I put password policy. The idea is we want to limit as much as possible the ability of customer to use extremely weak passwords. And by that I mean like top, could be top 1000, could be uh, something else, but really weak passwords. It can be used for password spraying, but also for password stuffing. And so we want to limit the, the ability of the attacker to try very common passwords. And there we are. <coughs> Uh, not perfect, but we are trying to improve as well. Currently what we have is we are the filter of passwords uh, to block some keywords. Like if you try, when you register or change your passwords to use your birth date, uh, email address, it will block it. So we block this kind of information. Uh, we also have complexity rules. So uh, I put slots, so lower uppercase, uppercase, digits and specials. So it's not really great, but uh, uh, that will probably improve uh, in the coming uh, months or years. Sorry, NIST, it's not perfect. Uh, but yeah, we, we are trying to improve in that area, and the also one side effect of the complexity rules is that if there was a data leak on a website that didn't have any complexity rules, usually the password of the customer will then be a bit different. So if someone is just doing a dumb password release attack and just submitting the the password from the leak, but not doing any modifications on them when submitting them, then it's actually protecting them to some extent. So there is a nice side effect to that. Second thing is password hashing, uh, because in this uh, whole uh, circle of uh, password reuse IQ systems, the password leak was, uh, database leak was uh, the first one, the first point, so we don't want to be that first point. So we want to limit, to limit the risk of uh, the credential, having the credentials of the customer uh, being leaked if one day we have a data leak and being at risk. So what do we do? It depends on the brand and the market. Uh, but on the core platform, what we do is we use Bcrypt with cost of eight. I will come back to this just after. Uh, and so those Bcrypts are salted and peppered. By that, I mean that salted, so there is a unique random value that is mixed with the password <coughs> that is dependent on the user and stored in the database. And by paper, uh, it's the same idea, but you have uh, one uh, random string that is random for the, the website that is not stored in database, but in a file. So that way, if there's data breach and the attacker had access to a database, he didn't access the co source code or he didn't access uh, the running application, so he won't be able to get it. So as long as he doesn't get that and has a proper full access, then he cannot crack the password. And again, I said Bcrypt cost of eight. Uh, people will say, hey, but uh, eight is uh, maybe a bit low. You should have gone for 10, 12, uh, uh, 14. Well, maybe, but it's a trade-off. Uh, as mentioned before, uh, we are event-based company uh, for big events. And when you have thousands or more of authentication in uh, time span, you, don't, you cannot just uh, have a very high value for uh, the cost of your hashing function. So this was decided trade-off uh, between having something extremely secure <coughs> and something that is a bit less secure but still quite good. Multi-factor authentication. Uh, so as we've seen uh, today, uh, multi-factor authentication is really good in, even if the credentials have uh, breach. So we want to, by implementing multi-factor authentication, you want to limit the ability uh, for the attacker to access the account if, uh, even if he has the correct credentials. So that pushes the attacker to really do targeted attacks. And when you do targeted attacks, the cost just explodes for the attacker. So we want to do that. What we do uh, is that we have implemented it in some markets with local uh, national schemes. Uh, you have Bank ID in Sweden and MID in Denmark. If you are not from uh, the Nordics, raise your hand. Yeah. 
So Bank ID uh, in Sweden, it's basically a national MFA scheme uh, that we have. Um, you enroll uh, your phone into this scheme, and then you have to, uh, when you are doing an action on your bank, on a national website or something else, basically it asks you to confirm this, uh, this sign-in or this action on your phone and to type in a PIN code on top of that. So you have to enroll your phone and you have to type in your PIN code. The good point with that is that it's a national scheme. Everyone is using it here. So when you deploy this kind of solution, everyone is going to use it, or at least very high percentage. So that's really good. On the other hand, on uh, a global, um, global market, except uh, where it's available, where we have national schemes available, we haven't deployed it yet. Uh, for a simple reason, it's hard to deploy it. It's hard to do MFA correctly uh, when you're a website because that means uh, user experience has to step in uh, to design new flows of authentication, of password reset, of registration. Uh, you have to translate everything on top of that. You have to implement that also on the technical side. And when you have multiple brands on multiple markets, that may not be always uh, feasible. So we are looking on how to deploy it in the best way, but uh, currently it's not available. And uh, that's actually one big chunk uh, uh, for this talk is for the proactive measures, we have something called PATH, or Password Audit Framework. And the idea is to break the cycle of uh, password reuse. So when you are dealing with password reuse attack, the attack started because the attacker had a leak somewhere, and he has been trying uh, those logins and passwords against your website. But there is delay between which uh, this uh, data leak is available on, on online, and then the attackers start to use it. And the idea with uh, PATH is that we want to be quicker uh, than the attackers at testing the slicked pass those slicked passwords against our customer to be able to contain the, uh, the risk and to force the users to reset the passwords before an attacker decides it's uh, better for him to do that instead of them. So to do that, what we've implemented is some homemade uh, Go and Python uh, scripts and toolkits uh, to manage data from uh, publicly available breaches, to check uh, that data against uh, customers' credentials, to flag the accounts that are doing password reuse, and to send those accounts through a forced password reset flow uh, so the, user have, the users have to change this, to change their passwords. We are not the only ones doing this. You have big companies like uh, Microsoft, Spotify that are doing this. Uh, Facebook probably, I think, uh, mentioned that in talks uh, a few years back. Uh, I know a lot of other companies are doing this, but don't talk about it publicly. But this is the kind of thing that uh, people are doing nowadays. One of the biggest questions when you have the, this kind of procedure is how do you get fixed? So the golden rule is we don't buy, we don't pay. We want to fight this kind of... Uh, um, of attacks, we want to fight this kind of threat actors. So no way, <laughs> no way we are going to give them money. No way. We are just, we are here to fight them. So we only use publicly available information. Uh, stuff like Pastebin, if you monitor uh, Pastebin likes website, you can usually grab some uh, fresh information. Um, people are putting some uh, credentials from some phishing attacks on there sometimes. It's low amount of accounts, but it's still fresh information, so it's still useful. Uh, you have big data leaks that usually end up on a website like uh, Mega, where you can uh, get them and uh, then process them on your site. So usually those ones are really large. And follow good sources of information. Uh, you have a lot of security researchers on Twitter that are posting uh, links to publicly available uh, databases, uh, you have security related forums or where this kind of stuff is shared as well. Um, sources is not what uh, is missing. If you search today online for LinkedIn, uh, data, there's a LinkedIn database that has leaked in 2012, not 2014, but from 2012, you will find it everywhere with the cracked passwords. So this is really something that is available for the attackers everywhere. How do we manage the process? Uh, we have dedicated hardware for password-related activities. So also when we do internal audits on passwords, on AD, we use this hardware, so everything is really, this hardware is just used for that. We have dedicated uh, VLAN with very strict password uh, firewall rules. We use encrypted volumes for sensitive data. For the hardware, we have a 
2 XA, 28, 30 threads, 128 uh, gigabytes of memory, 8 NVIDIA, 820, 1080 TYs. Uh, it's a Nice super micro rack, uh, four and a half uh, U. When you make it uh, uh, spin at 100%, you can he hear it uh, <coughs> through the wall, so it's quite nice. <laughs> One time we had developers coming at our desk asking uh, if, if it was a security alarm or something. So <laughs> Close. <laughs> and the core of uh, this checking process uh, is a tool that we call Path Credentials Checker. Uh, this one, uh, it's, so it's matching the data from the leaks against the data of our customers. It's in Go, it's heavily multi-threaded uh, because comparing BigQuery is super slow. And the idea is on one side you have uh, data leak, which is what we, I call a mapping ID and a password. Usually in a leak it's an email, a semi, uh, colon, uh, password or username, uh, colon, password. Uh, here I just call this mapping ID. And you on your side you just provide like uh, same, some kind of, uh, not CSV, but a colon separated value, uh, where you have, um, so internal IDs that are, are going just to be the stuff that will be outputting. We don't output uh, anything else, so we don't output the password that has matched or anything else, we just input uh, IDs of accounts that have matched. Uh, also hash types, <coughs> hash, uh, salt, if uh, we use uh, uh, salt in this case. But the tool is agnostic of the mapping ID, so you can use everything. In the list, it's usernames and emails. But what we do to avoid storing a huge trove of personal information from modern people on the internet is we use truncated hashes with collisions. So when we import a data leak, we hash uh, the emails, and we just keep uh, the very, very beginning of uh, the hash of the email address. So it has collisions, but so it will increase the processing time. But at the same time, uh, we want collisions to avoid having uh, really something that is still identifiable and can be mapped to someone. And uh, if there is a full collision, like someone uh, having collision on the first on the first parts of the hash of his email, and also uh, the same password, that probably means that he is using an extremely common password. So it's not that bad to ask him to reset his password after that. And yeah, as mentioned, we just output internal IDs. So these ones are just uh, numeric values on our side. So we don't uh, output any PII or any passwords or anything. So when we give the list to, uh, for the fraud team to action it and to reset the passwords, then they don't have more information, just, okay, there was a match on this account. And is it effective? Yes, uh, we started that in uh, 2018, and since 2018 we flagged nearly 1 million accounts. So it's 1 million accounts that were at immediate risk of being compromised. And that was prevented. One other thing, uh, we detected a uh, quite broad attack just after starting this process, and the attack actually uh, covered one group that we already processed uh, through this tool, and one group that we didn't process. And the compromission ratio, the compromission rate, comp uh, compromise rate uh, between uh, this group that was not covered by this process and the group that was covered by this process was extremely different. While just a few accounts were, uh, like, even, I don't remember exactly the figures, but really low amount of uh, account tested were compromised on the one, test, uh, verified on the, account, on the ones that were uh, checked by PATH the other group was much, much higher. And thankfully, in that case, we already had implemented other detection uh, and reaction uh, methods, so we were able to uh, block everything and to reset the password manually after that. But that was a really good showcase of why this is extremely important and why this is working so well. One other thing uh, that was raised when we started this process, especially at the very beginning, is during the first run, we had identified around 300,000 accounts. And when we were planning to action them the first time, uh, one big question from customer services, customer support, uh, was, hey, but we need to, to really plan for this because just imagine sending emails to 300,000 people asking them to reset the passwords. Just imagine the amount of calls we're going to have. And the thing is, to date, uh, with every, so nearly one million accounts flagged, 
uh, CS has not suffered negatively from this process. Sure, there are probably uh, there are probably some more calls that have been made, but nothing that went uh, out of uh, uh, out of scale. Everything was manageable. And if you want to try uh, this, we are going to we actually released this uh, Puff uh, credentials checker tool. It's on our GitHub. Uh, as mentioned, it's in Go. I'm a really bad Go developer, so if uh, there is someone with a bit more Go skills than me that wants to uh, take a look at it and improve it, let's go for it. And yeah, don't hesitate to do pull requests, to do more stuff uh, on it. It's, it. We just want it to, to grow, to release it to the community. So, in a nutshell, uh, to finish, there are really many, many, many mechanisms and techniques, as we've seen, to uh, raise the costs of attacks and to push attackers into uh, having to put much more money to be able to potentially <coughs> compromise very little, uh, very small amount of uh, uh, accounts. But the important uh, question for you is prioritization. Uh, sure, you can try to implement everything we have done like we've done, but is it relevant for you? Is, it, is your threat model the same as ours? You really need, need to look deeply into what are the attacks you are receiving nowadays. What is your threat model? What do you want to implement? And again, there are no, um, everything can be a quick win. Uh, putting CAPTCHA in place, okay, sure, it can be bypassed, but it will already block uh, uh, little Kevin's in their uh, uh, basement uh, trying uh, to run uh, Hydra and Hydra tools to try to do basic password stuffing. You have quick wins. Other point is that uh, how much effort can you put in deploying these new controls? Sure, again, you can say, oh, I want everything that has been presented here. But can you do it? It's not involving just development. It's involving security, fraud, uh, development, uh, tech guys uh, from IT, uh, customer service. It's involving a lot of people. And you don't want to put too much pressure on, on teams that are already uh, extremely busy. The key point for everything that has been presented here is really communication as well. We don't see the same thing as the fraud teams are seeing. In security operations, in my team, we see stuff at high level. We see large scale stuff and we see large scale patterns. At the fraud level, they see really targeted attacks and some stuff that is a bit, bit more uh, <coughs> specific. So you need to learn how other teams are working. Um, Last year, I spent a day uh, with the fraud teams just showing what we were doing on our side and them showing me what they were doing. And after that day, we all learned much more about what everyone was doing and how, and how we could help each other. That was really uh, something that helped us all in that. Because you want to all improve together. You cannot have just a security team pushing for all those controls even against business, against uh, developers. You need to all work on that and to all agree on that. And to make concessions, as I mentioned, with uh, big creeps not being uh, uh, cost 12 or uh, higher, you have to make concessions. Security is here to enable the business as well. We are not here to constrain everything. And last but not least, share, share intelligence and share patterns. You have nice tools like uh, MISP, that are made to store intelligence and to share them with communities. Internally, uh, we try to use it to keep track of attacks we are seeing, because since it's doing correlation, you can directly know when you import source IP addresses or other uh, patterns information. Oh, I've seen that in that, that attack, that attack, that attack, that attack. So it's probably same guy is trying to do the same thing. And now we can see how he's trying to change his patterns. So keep track of everything, discuss, communicate, and coordinate. And one last thing before finishing, we are recording. <laughs> <laughs> so you can check careers.kim.group.com if you are looking for a job on the corporate department. 
uh, we are looking for uh, people in our um, internal offensive teams, uh, offensive team. So if you want to do internal pen tests, internal security reviews, go there. And if you have nothing uh, listed but you're interested, just ping me on Twitter or send me an email. Thank you all, and uh, I will take the questions now.